Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Fold Academy. We'll get started in just a bit so that folks who registered for uh, can join the session. Feel free to introduce yourself if you haven't already in the chat. We'll close it in a few minutes while the workshop is underway. My name is Samantha Clark. I'm the volunteer and audience engagement coordinator at the Festival of Literary Diversity, or SFOLD as we commonly call it. You're currently turning into the sixth Fold Academy session called Mastering Dialogue with Sharon Bala. Sharon Bala's best-selling debut novel, the, Vo the Boat People, won the 2020 NL Book Award and the 2019 Harper Lee Prize for Legal Fiction, which was shortlisted for several awards. And in translation in four languages, Sharon is also a member of the Port Authority at St. John's Newfoundland's Writing Group. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and will be answered at the end. It's now time to bring on Sharon. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks, Samantha, for that lovely introduction. I'm going to do a terrifying thing and share my screen. Um, all right. Okay, so thanks for coming to this workshop on mastering dialogue. Um, <clears throat> I always like to begin my workshops and anytime I'm working with writers or private clients, I like to begin with a couple of caveats. The first is that there are no hard and fast rules for good writing. And anyone, I think anyone who tells you otherwise is not being accurate. Uh, there are only guidelines and those guidelines will serve us about 75 to 90% of the time. So anything I say today that sounds like a rule is really just a guideline. And sometimes the best thing you can do is to set it aside and do the complete opposite. Remember that every story and every author are completely different. And so what serves you for one story won't necessarily serve you for the next. Um, all right. So this is a quick outline of how we're going to go forward. So I'm going to be parsing passages of dialogue from three different stories, three different books. And then there's going to be time, hopefully, at the end for a quick list of laundry uh, tips, laundry list of tips. Ooh. And then uh, about 15 minutes for Q&A. I've got a clock on the side that I'm going to keep my eye on. And at 1245, I'm going to cut myself off and leave some time for Q&A. Okay, so I think the best teacher is a story or a book you love. And so that's why we're going to be looking at passages of dialogue from three books that I love. The first one is a book called Such Big Dreams. Um, and it was written by the author Rima Patel. It came out a couple of years ago. And, you know, dialogue can do many, many things in a story. And I wanted to begin with uh, an example of dialogue that's very serviceable. So this is speech that is serving a very practical function for the reader. In the book, um, Such Big Dreams, it's a novel set in Mumbai at a charity called Justice for All. The story is told in first person from the point of view of Rocky, who is a former street kid who's now working at a peon at this charity. The office is mostly made up of locals who all speak Hindi and uh, three foreign interns who only speak English. Everyone in the office uh, understands English fluently. Everyone speaks English fluently with the exception of our hero, Raki, who can understand, but um, her spoken English is not as good. Um, this scene is taken from near the start of the book. And the main function of this scene is just to set things up, to introduce you to characters, to introduce you to the dynamics between them. There is a new intern who's just arrived. His name is Alex and it's his first day on the job. Let me try to make this small. Okay. Rocky, Gowry Ma'am shouts from her office. Show him around the office, nah. Do I have to tell you how to do everything myself? Gee, ma'am, I call back. Turning to Alex, I stand up. You come, see office. Sure, that's great. Building old, lift no working, I say, opening the door leading into the corridor. Men's toilet this way. He peeks his head out into the hallway. 
I lead Alex back through the waiting area and into the lawyer's workspace, a U-shaped formation of desks pushed up against the wall at the front of the office. It's separated from the intern's workspace, a unanimous request from the lawyers once Justice for All started hiring Ferengis to work for free. All lawyers working this space, I say, and a few of them turn their heads toward us, eyeing him. Okay, I'm just gonna stop here and start uh, sort of dissecting what's happening. So notice here at the very top, there is the boss of this place, Gauri Mam, and Rocky. And notice the, um, the kind of power dynamics between them that are revealed through the dialogue. Gauri Mam is shouting and Rocky is being uh, very obsequious. And so already, without telling, the author has shown us and revealed the power distinction between them. And then notice um, Rocky's dialogue when she's speaking to Alex and showing him around the office. So she's forced to speak in English because he doesn't speak Hindi. You can see that her English is um, is limited. The grammar is, is not very proper. But notice that she's not searching for words. You know, when she says, building old, lift no working, men's toilet this way, it's almost as if this is a speech that she has um, that she has memorized. And so you can guess that she gives this speech a lot. And then because the, the, the dialogue is quite clipped, it's a little bit funny. And then the other thing that's funny, of course, is that again, this dialogue is revealing something about the setting, about the office, that it's run down, that they have very little money. And then in the next bit, um, notice here, I just want to point out the word Ferengi, which is not an English word, obviously, and is never translated for us, and is also not in italics. Um, and this is a book that doesn't have a glossary, and I just wanted to point all that out, because sometimes what happens is these words that are not in English, they get italicized, they're explained, there's a glossary, it's just a lot of, like, you know, spoon-feeding the reader, which I think we can all understand in context what the word means. Um, okay, I've steered Alex back to his workstation and left him there when Bhavna, the lead lawyer in Justice for All's anti-human trafficking cases, calls me to her desk. So, she says in a low voice, who's that guy? I don't know, some Ferengi. She studies me carefully, flipping her shoulder-length hair to reveal a gray streak that grows wider every week. Are, you were talking to him, weren't you? Okay, so notice here, there's a new character. This is Bhavna, the lead lawyer. So she's more senior to Rocky, but obviously not the boss. And so again, notice the, the character, the dynamic, the power dynamic between them that's revealed in the dialogue. Um, they're a lot more collegial. So you can guess that they've been working together for a while. They're a lot more casual with each other. Um, but uh, Bhavna seems nicer to Rocky, honestly, than the boss. So there's an idea there of, again, without telling the author, Rima Patel has shown us the uh, hierarchy in the office. Okay, contrast the dynamic between these two with the dynamic between the three interns, the English speaking interns. Here they are meeting uh, Alex for the first time. We're doing the fieldwork portion of our master's in international development studies at the University of Amsterdam, Merrill says. We're here to research how people use the legal system to protect informal housing settlements. What about you? Well, I'm starting my master's in public administration in September. Where? Harvard, he says, with the hint of a smile. So these three are speaking English and Rocky is sort of tidying up and eavesdropping. And notice again here, the dialogue is very practical. It's just telling us who these characters are and why they're here in Mumbai. But again, notice that they're meeting for the first time. They don't know each other, unlike Raka and, Rocky and Bhavna. And so the language and the tone is very formal. Words like legal system and informal housing settlements, instead of saying, we're here to see how people use the law to protect their slums, right? That's much, much more casual, but instead they're being um, sort of formal because it's the first time they're meeting and they're in a workplace setting. Um, so, you know, when you're writing your own dialogue, you want to think about not just 
who the characters are and what their diction and word choice might be, but also who are they speaking with and how might they moderate their tone or their word choice or what they say or what they don't say um, in the context of who they're speaking with and who else can hear. Okay, let's go on. I reach past Saskia for the keyboard on the new desk, turning it over in my hands and thumping its backside. A few months worth of crumbs, little black and brown hairs, and a dried out spider fall out. Saskia huffs, rolls her chair to the right so she can see Alex again, then resumes drilling him about where he's from, Toronto, that's in Canada, how long he's been in India, about a month, if he speaks Hindi, here and there, and what he wants to do after Harvard. Is it cliche of me to say I want to make a difference in the world? So again, I love this passage because the author has, um, first I want to point out how the author has mixed in summary dialogue with direct dialogue. So if you don't know what summary is, summary is just a summation of everything that is said. So unlike direct dialogue, which is usually what we see in quotation marks, um, you know, direct dialogue is word for word what the character has said in the order that he has said it where summary dialogue is just a summation. So we get Saskia's um, interrogation as a summation. She's asking where he's from, how long he's been in India, if he speaks Hindi, et cetera. So the one thing that summary dialogue can do is it can uh, increase the pace. It can get through a scene faster than if we had heard every single word that Saskia said. And every single word she says is not that important. She's not a very major character. It's probably going to be pretty boring if we hear word for word what he says, what she says, whereas Alex is going to be a pretty pivotal figure in the story. And so it's more important that we hear exactly what he says. But even then, it's uh, very short and clipped. We're not getting everything. We're just getting a little bit in these um, in these brackets. And I just want to show you how um, notice how. The the word choice and the choice of phrases reveals something about who he is. He says here and there to answer, you know, how much Hindi do you speak? Instead of saying a little bit or nothing at all, which is actually the truth. He doesn't speak anything at all, um, but he's saying here and there. And then notice too here this great line. Is it cliche of me to say I want to make a difference in the world? Here it is revealed that he is both naive and hopeful and kind of young, but also uh, self-aware enough to know that what he's saying is a little bit cliche, is pretty cliche. And so again, this is the beauty of what direct dialogue can do is it can reveal a character um, in more depth and detail than something like summary. I also love that we haven't lost sight of our hero, Rocky. Here she is, the eye. You know, and we see her in motion. She's reaching past Saskia. And then notice these like very sharp specifics. She's thumping out the word backside too, right? Which is a very like South Asian word choice. Uh, again, that word choice is so accurate for her. This is something we're always having to think about with dialogue is word choice. But she's thumping out, you know, dried out spider, the brown and black hairs, et cetera. And then Saskia huffs and she rolls her chair. And so there's like, motion happening and action happening in the scene. The scene is not static. It's not just talking heads. And you're right there in the scene. And so you want to think sometimes about not just what the characters are saying, but how they're moving through space and how you can weave in scene setting into your uh, passages of dialogue so that the dialogue isn't so stagnant. Um, and like, I just, I wanted to sort of use this passage because it could have been so boring uh, because again this is direct this is dialogue that's used just for a very practical purpose but it's not boring because we're getting to see the office we're being introduced to all these characters we're getting a sense for um, the character dynamics between the different colleagues okay the next uh, passage of dialogue I want to I want to talk about comes from a story in the collection Lesser Known Monsters of the 21st Century by Kim Fu. The whole collection is just absolutely brilliant. But this story in particular, uh, which is called June Bugs, is about a woman named Martha who has escaped an abusive boyfriend and hidden herself in a rented farmhouse in the countryside. It's the middle of the pandemic and she's working from home. And she's a call center worker for a company that's sort of like Amazon that is called Shop Global. 
Um, the ex-boyfriend's name is Neil, and she hasn't seen or heard from him in months, but she's um there's this low hum of tension through the story where she's afraid that he's going to find her. Um, and she's very kind of afraid of that. And then the other thing that's happening is that there is a bug infestation of beetles in this uh, house that she is renting that's causing this added level of tension to the scene. And the reason I chose this passage is it's a wonderful example of how to use uh, dialogue to ramp up tension. Thank you for shopping with Shop Global. My name is Martha. Who am I speaking with? Neil. She paused. There were hundreds of Shop Global reps, once spread out over five call centers in three time zones, now in their own homes. He could call over and over for days on end and never reach her. Hi, Neil. How can I help you? I ordered a bottle of laundry detergent and it was leaking when it arrived. I can definitely help you with that, she chirped. Was the packaging damaged or just the product itself? Well, it soaked through the box, so I guess both. She and Neil, her Neil, had rarely spoken on the phone. This voice was huskier than she remembered his, with the sulky, dragged out syllables of a teenager. I'm sorry to hear that. Would you like a refund or a replacement? Replacement. No problem. Can you give me the order number? She typed in the number he gave her after brushing away a beetle that had fallen in the gap between the space bar and the row of keys above. Hmm, that number isn't coming up for me. How long ago did you place the order? About four months ago. Martha's hand went to her stomach, which felt unsettled. She was certain she'd been eating the beetles, that she couldn't have noticed every single one to fall or crawl into her food. And it just arrived? No, it arrived four months ago. I'm sorry, but we only offer ret returns and replacements within 60 days. I didn't have time to call, he said. I'm very busy. I am sorry, she repeated, but that's the policy. There's nothing I can do. I paid for detergent, and I just got a big soapy mess. I understand that. I'm very unhappy about this. His voice changed, as though he was suddenly fully aware, fully engaged in this conversation. What did you say your name was again? Martha. Do you like your job, Martha? She'd gotten this question from customers before. It's a living. Are you happy, in general, with your life? I suppose so, sir. Is there anything further I can help you with regarding your order? Where are you? She swiped at her neck, thinking she'd felt another bug, but there was nothing there. I'm not sure that's relevant. I just want to know if you're in a call center in Bangladesh faking an American accent. I am indeed in the continental US, sir. That's vague. What city? Sir, if I can't help you with your order, it's time for us to say goodbye. Don't you dare hang up on me. Don't you fucking hang up on me. She was allowed to disconnect him as soon as he used the word fucking, but it would trigger a review of her call logs. Tell you what, Neil, she said. How about I give you a coupon for free shipping and 15% off your next order? I want to know where you are. Tell me where you are, Martha. She had been hovering her cursor over the red disconnect button, but now her hand slipped from the mouse and onto the desk. Neil, she whispered. Yes, what? Is that you? What do you mean? Yes, it's Neil. I'm still here. Did you hang up on me? I can't help you. She was still whispering. She couldn't hang up on him now. She didn't want anyone ever listening to the recording. I wish things were different. I wish things hadn't happened the way they did but I can't help you. Silence. They listened to each other breathe. The stranger on the other end sighed and said, finally, I'll take the coupon. <laughs> I, um, I really love this uh, passage and there is a lot to parse. So I'm just gonna go back to the beginning so we can look at it from the start. So the first thing I want to talk about is the difference between text and subtext. 
Text is the words the characters are saying, uh, the dialogue between them that is actually on the page. And subtext is the stuff that is between the lines, the kind of elephant in the room that no one is uh, overtly talking about, but is there all the time. And so in this conversation, there's almost like two conversations happening. There's the customer service call, which is the text. And there is the subtext, which is that Martha doesn't know if this is her ex-boyfriend, Neil. And if it is indeed the ex-boyfriend, Neil, it's uncertain to Martha and the reader whether Neil knows this is his ex-girlfriend, Martha, or if he at some point figures it out or starts to suspect. And so that is the subtext. And there is tension in the text, in the call itself, this customer service call, um, particularly because that moment where Neil wants something, he wants the, the refund, the replacement, and Martha doesn't or cannot give it to him. And that disconnect between character A wants something, character B can't provide it, automatically causes uh, tension and conflict. And so there's that tension and conflict, which is at the kind of textual level, the surface level. And then there is the, the ramping tension and conflict of the subtext, you know, is this the ex-boyfriend? Has he found her? What will he do now? Will he physically show up at her door? This is very frightening to her. <clears throat> and so that's one of the things. And then also I wanted just to point out the difference in um, the tone between the two of them. So she is quite formal and professional. Everything she says, you know, I can definitely help you with that. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, can you give me the order number? Whereas when he speaks, he's much more um, informal. Well, it's so through the box, I guess, you know, and about four months ago. And, you know, um, you know, she's saying, I'm sorry, we do not offer. And he's saying, I paid for it. And I just got this big soapy mess. So that kind of disconnect, you know, that sort of uh, disconnect between them, the difference of their tone is, first of all, true to life. Um and, and makes sense and is accurate for these two characters. One is at work, one is not. But it also very subtly also sets up a bit of tension between them. Because again, there's that different power dynamic happening, right? Um, and then there's another level of tension, which is brought in by, of course, these bugs, you know, she puts her hand on her stomach because she feels unsettled and she thinks it's because she's eating the beetles. But of course, the reader is wondering, is it actually because she's very nervous? Notice, too, the ramping up of conflict in the phone call, right, that it doesn't really ramp up until she says, I'm sorry, I can't give you what you want. And he gets increasingly angry and belligerent about this. And it really reaches a, a point of tension when he asks, what was your name again? You know, and where are you? That where are you is so is so upsetting to her. Um, and frankly, it was to me as the reader, I'm sure it is to you too. Uh, and then of course, it's the climax point of the phone call is when he yells at her, don't you hang up on me, don't you fucking hang up on me. This kind of anger is um, very frightening. And and that's really, I think for me, the climactic moment of the phone call. Um, and then notice too, this is my, this uh, passage and this is why I chose to talk about it. Notice here, listen, Neil, she whispered. Yes, what, is that you? What do you mean? Yes, it's Neil, I'm still here. Did you hang up on me? I can't help you. I wish things were different. I wish things hadn't happened the way they did, but I can't help you. So notice how here the dialogue is addressing both the text, customer service call, and the subtext, the potential of the ex-boyfriend. What she's saying could be words that she could be saying to either of the two Neils. And this moment where the, the dialogue addresses the text and the subtext is something that is, is relatively rare, but um, pay attention to it when you notice it in fiction uh, and pay attention when you notice it actually in real life. Um, that's really when I start to pay attention to real life conversations is when I notice it. Because I think if you can, if you can have this happen in a story, it just, the dialogue is, is so uh, textured and delicious and absolutely riveting um, because it is the moment where it's almost like the elephant is being addressed, um, the elephant in the room. 
Okay, next passage. Final passage comes from the novel Reproduction by Ian Williams. Uh, there is a 10 to 12 page section in the middle of this novel where all you get is direct dialogue. It is just naked speech stripped bare. There is no tension, there is no conflict, there is no scenery, there is no um, interior thought, there's no action. There's just nothing but uh, direct dialogue. There's not even quotation marks. Um, so let's read. I'm, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I'm just gonna, I've picked out some passages. Mom, where's dad? Away. Away where? All over. He's a pilot. He has to fly planes all over the world. Does he ever fly here? Sometimes. And he comes to see me. Sometimes at night, but he says don't wake you. And he sleeps in your bed. Yes, in his uniform. Mom, is that dad's airplane? No, I don't think so. How do you know? His airplane has a red tail. Mom, can I have a brother? What about a fish? No, a brother. Can you make me one? It's not so simple. With daddy, I know. What do you know? And can you make him older? Mom, I think it's time for a new dad. What's wrong with the old dad? He's never here. I'm always here though. Mom, I'm seven. I can't wait forever. My clock's ticking. You real old. And you're not getting any younger, doll. If we get a new dad, then that way you won't be alone. Is that what you want? Do you want to be alone forever, Mom? Mom, is Dad dead? When you turn so callous? It's just a question. Don't act like you love him. Mom, do you think Dad looks like me? You look like him. Do you think people will recognize me? Rich white men in a certain circle, yes. Those are my peeps. And what about your black mother who killing she sell for you? Joke, mom, don't go all Rosa Parks. Um, so if you haven't read Reproduction, first of all, it's wonderful. But by this point in the novel, the reader knows this mother, her name is Felicia. Uh, but this is her our first introduction to her son who we've never met before. And this is the first time we see her in the role of mother. And I just think that Ian is such a master of direct dialogue that he can use it on its own to both show the passage of time. Notice how when we met these, uh, when we met the son, he's quite young and naive. And then we see him kind of grow up into to, uh, a more precocious, a more knowing, a more cynical kind of a child. But he knows his characters so well that he can uh, reveal the passage of time. He can show the evolution of the boy from a naive child to a precocious older child. Um, you know, by the end of this section, uh, he's a he's a young teenager. And so we very quickly uh, kind of run through time. And, and what you've read here is maybe 50 words of dialogue from the son, but already with just those few words, we know his preoccupations. He's preoccupied with this father he's never met. We know he's a wise ass. We know he feels protective of his mother. We know he's a little bit cynical. We know he's optimistic. Uh, so much of who he is and why he is this way is revealed in just a few words. And so the reason that I wanted to include this uh, passage and the reason why I love this so much is that for me, the takeaway here is that you must know your characters fully and thoroughly in order to be able to write their dialogue really well, you know, speech that only they would say. And so if there's only one thing that you take away from this entire workshop, it is this. If you're having trouble figuring out what your characters would say, if you're writing dialogue and it's not really working, probably the problem is that you don't know the characters well enough to be able to hear them uh, organically in your head. Okay, now we're gonna move on to just uh, some tips that I wanna leave you with before we get to the Q&A. How to write interesting dialogue. Ask yourself, who wants what? You know, you've got Martha and you've got Neil on this phone call. What does each of them want? If character A wants something, character B shouldn't oblige. Because if you have that set up already, there is going to be some kind of conflict. 
And remember the characters don't have to answer the questions they are asked. Again, think about, um, well, think about um, Felicia and her son, right? She's He's asking questions and she isn't quite answering them or she's giving him answers that he doesn't want to hear. Or think about um, Martha and Neil. You know, he's asking her questions. Where are you? Where are you? And she doesn't answer. Ask yourself who has the power in a conversation, especially if it's a dyad. And then can the power dynamic change? Can the power move back and forth between characters? It's good to think about leaving things unsaid. And I don't just mean the subtext. I mean, just leaving things unsaid um, that are just there between the lines. And leave some someone wanting, leave one of the characters wanting, and then use subtext. And that's how you write interesting dialogue. Well, that's some of the ways you write interesting dialogue. Um, so some tips I have, it's good to read all of the dialogue out loud and very slowly. You know, sometimes when I'm reading dialogue that I've written and I have an instinct, to, I, I want to read it faster. I wanna quickly go through it. That's a sign that I'm bored and that there's something wrong here. So maybe the dialogue is the pace is too slow. Um, and the solution might, to that might be to take all the direct dialogue and see what can be changed into indirect or summary dialogue. Or it might be that there's not enough conflict, or it might be that it's just boring. And so reading it out loud is a good way to hear if you are and to feel if you are bored. Ask yourself as you're reading the dialogue out loud, does it sound authentic? Is the tone correct? The tone uh, of the character, the tone uh, within the, the, the dynamic and the conversation. Do the words match the character? Is this something the character would authentically say? Um, are these words that the character would use? Are these words that match the character? This is a really big one. Are the characters talking to each other or are they talking to the reader? I think, um, Sorry, I think sometimes what I notice uh, working with um, clients on their work and, and with myself is that sometimes it feels like uh, characters are saying things that both parties already know. And so a quick tip for this is if you can put the words as you know at the beginning of the sentence, <laughs> that's a really good hint that the characters are speaking to the reader which means that you as the author are reaching for direct dialogue to do something that another tool in your toolkit could do better. If you want the reader to know something, yes, you can use direct dialogue to get it across. I think I showed that through Rima Patel's um, passage. You know, she's using dialogue to get across why these characters are here in Mumbai doing this internship. Um, but sometimes it's better to use something else. You can reveal it through action. You can reveal it through uh, interior thought or narration or exposition or, um, or, uh, or even setting um, or body language. Dialogue is only one tool. Like you have so many other tools, so try not to overuse it. Don't forget about things like body language and stage business and action. And so uh, if you think back to the first passage we read, there's the action of uh, Rocky, the in, the uh, peon kind of eavesdropping by cleaning up around her. You know, there's the stage business of um, Saskia, the intern, huffing and rolling her chair away. And then body language can be used to great effect, of course, in... Um, in dynamics where characters are talking to each other. Multitasking dialogue is much more interesting than dialogue that is only doing one thing. So ask yourself, what is the dialogue doing? Is it revealing character? Is it pushing, is it pushing plot forward? Is it uh, increasing tension? The more things that dialogue can do, the more interesting it becomes. All right, I've left about 20 minutes for questions. Um, so hopefully there are some. Yes, we do have a few questions in the Q&A box, but feel free to leave them there. As Sharon did mention, we do have about 20 minutes, so feel free to put them in now. Um, so 
I'm just going to, okay, you can keep your screen up there because you have your website there. That's beautiful. Um, so someone did ask, what is your favorite method of getting to know your characters better? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I have a few kind of tried and true things. Sometimes what happens is um, I run into a block with a character where I think I know the character pretty well and I try to write something for them and it's not coming out. So what I do is I oh, when I'm going to bed, I uh, kind of as I'm lying in bed trying to go to sleep, I sort of circle around the character and ask one specific question of the character. Um, and I just kind of almost like meditate on it and then go to sleep. And what I'm hoping is that my uh, sleeping brain is going to do some work for me while I'm sleeping and that I'm going to wake up and have an answer. And it might not be that I wake up and I and my first thought is, oh, there's the answer to this character. It might be that I wake up and I go to my desk quietly. And, you know, before I talk to anyone, when I'm just having my coffee, I might start just jotting notes and then something can come out. So that's one way. Um, but uh, the thing that I often do, which I don't know, know that I necessarily recommend this because I overdo it, is I write a lot of backstory for my characters. I uh, start thinking about what they were like as kids and, you know, what they did in their lives to get them to the point where we meet them in the story. Um, and I find that that's a really good way to get to know my characters. But the sort of double edged sword of that is that I end up putting a lot of that backstory into my stories. And then I have to pull it all away at some point and kill those darlings. And that becomes very difficult to do. <laughs> so I'm almost hesitant to to you to give that as a as a hint, but or like a tip. But yeah, I like to think a lot about who they who they are who they were in their lives um outside of the story that makes a lot of sense that's a great answer um I just wanted to ask one question Sharon and just for everyone mm -hmm. to um the recording of this session will be emailed to you but someone was curious about the powerpoint slides if you'd be able to share those um no I'm not going to share my powerpoint slides but I'm going to give you something better um which I think um someone at the fold will will share First, I'll give you a list of the three books um, uh, with the page numbers if you want to go back and, and have a look, a closer look at the passages. And then um, I have a lot of information on my website about dialogue, a lot more than I shared here. And I'll uh, share links to that. So it'll be better than a handout. Amazing. Um, there's, there's a lot of information there. So all of the kind of laundry list of tips I gave at the end and more, and then more details on like what is direct dialogue, what summary dialogue. Um, I have a whole philosophy about quotation marks, using them and not using them. You might've noticed that in the Ian Williams um, section at the end, that passage at the end, there are no quotation marks at all. Yeah. So you will get a lot afterward. That's so perfect. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Sharon. Uh, so Rashi did ask, how do you effectively balance between direct dialogue and description? For example, descriptors in between of shaking spiders out of the back backside of your keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so when I'm first drafting, I often, um, I don't know if anyone is old enough to remember transparencies in school on, on projectors, uh, where you would have one thing and then they would layer on another and another and another. So often what I do is, let's say it's a conversation, let's say it's a scene where it's uh, very direct dialogue heavy and two characters are having conversation. Often I start by, well, first of all, I don't, I try not to write direct dialogue unless it comes to me automatically and I hear it. And I feel like for me at least, when I know the characters so well, they just start talking, um, not to me, but to each other. And it's almost like they just come into the they come into the room on my head and they start talking. And all I have to do is just write down what they say. And so when that happens, I quickly write down what they say. And um, then that becomes a kind of the first layer is just dialogue stripped bare, almost like what you saw in the Ian Williams uh, passages, dialogue stripped bare. And then I go in and I add um, body language for the two characters. So I add, how are they kind of moving through space? How are they using their bodies? And I'm often thinking about what is the emotion that they are feeling in that moment? And I try to embody it with the body language. And then I think about, okay, where are they 
physically in space? Like what room are they in? What setting are they in? Are they out in the world? Uh, and I add, let's say they're out, outside on a hike. Then I add, what's the temperature like? What's the weather like? What's the landscape like? What is the flora and fauna like? What does it smell like? And I'm trying to engage all of my senses. Often like I'll go on a hike, say, or I go to a cafe and like just make notes and then come back and add that in. You can see that my process is really ridiculous and very tedious. So this is not necessarily what works for everyone, but this is what works for me. Um, so then I have setting. And then I start thinking about, okay, can I get these people moving around? And I add that in. And uh, again, this I'm not recommending this because I think my process I'm realizing is like very ridiculous, but I often write like paragraphs of each of these. And then I take like cut and paste sentences and then literally weave things in. And often it's a lot of weaving it, like doing a first pass at this kind of weaving and then printing it off and then going through and seeing, okay, maybe this works better here. And maybe this works better here. And maybe I can like move things around. But sometimes what happens is when I start weaving all those other things in, I find that there are uh, ways in which a, a bit of action, like say a character on a hike trips and almost falls, right? Like trips on like one of those, um, oh, what they call like a tree, a tree root and almost falls. Maybe, maybe I can move that to happen at a moment where they have said the wrong thing in this conversation, right? So then the the saying the wrong thing, which is which is audibly awkward, then there's the added awkwardness of almost tripping and falling, right? So that that's how that's how I do it. I don't know how anyone else does it, but. That's a great answer. I love that you would go out in the wild and like make your notes. Oh, I love oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's the only way. Otherwise, you're just sitting in your office and yeah. um, and and trying to imagine it, which is not fun at all. It's much better to go out and yeah, be in the world. So uh, Ava asked, um, any tips for writing dialogue when it's memoir and if you're trying to stay true to the reality? Ooh. <laughs> Wow, I don't know actually, um, because I tr I don't write memoir, um, and I hope to never write memoir because it sounds like the most terrifying thing. Um, but here's my tip. So my tip is always this is my cheat: find a memoir you like and see how they have done it, and then try to read widely in terms of memoir. Um, I'm trying to think, does Carmen Maria Machado in, in the Dream House, which is just the most fantastic uh, memoir, form-busting memoir, I can't remember if she has any dialogue in there, but that might be interesting. Um, or uh, Jenny Hyjan Will's um, older sister, not necessarily related, is also really interesting. Um, yeah, I would look at and see how other authors do uh, deal with dialogue in memoir. But my instinct, if I was to write a memoir or to write anything memoir-ish, first person, um, first person nonfiction, I might actually not use quotation marks at all and maybe use direct, indirect dialogue and summary dialogue more than direct dialogue. Because the thing with direct dialogue is, at least in fiction, what you're saying is, these are the words the character is saying. But with indirect dialogue, there's a bit of a blurring of the lines between the dialogue and the narration or the exposition um, or the dialogue and the interior thought. It sort of um, blurs the lines a bit and it's a little less declarative. And so maybe there's some room there to play with, maybe this is what was said, but maybe not or maybe this was what was said, or maybe this is how I, as the author, the first person of this memoir, recall it or, or um, experienced it. This is how I heard it. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that did. Um, also, if anyone else has a comment to, to help Ava out with any tips, I did um, enable other participants to comment on the questions. So you can feel free to do that. That's a really good question. I, I've worked with memoir authors um, who do wonder about this more globally, like in terms of um, 
what is the correct thing to do by which I mean, what is the, uh, in terms of veracity, what is true? Because of course you, you're limited always by the unreliability of the first person, right? Mm -hmm. And also memory, memory is so funny. But then of course you can play with that um, in memoir. Oh, very exciting, very exciting. So our next question is, do you find great dialogue is typically formed in the revision process rather than writing the initial draft? Uh, no, not for me, not personally. Um, personally, the, the best dialogue is the stuff that um, comes in uh, instinctively and kind of automatically. It's like the one thing that for me, I cannot force and I will not force. Um, and sometimes I have known that I have to write a scene where there's dialogue and I will just put it off until it comes to me because trying to force it is is hard. Um, but I will say that dialogue, my scenes with a lot of, I'm doing a lot of revision right now actually, but my scenes with dialogue um, are always improved in the revision process. And how that happens is that often my editor will write a note in the margin and say something like, can you expand on this? Or can we have an, a moment of emotion here? Or why is this character saying this? And um, I'll pull my hair out and whine and cry about it. And then I'll come back to it. And where she's asking for expansion, that is sometimes where I think, okay, so now I need something like, um, maybe I need some body language, or maybe I need some small moment of physical activity or physical action. And then those things make uh, kind of elevate the dialogue, even if it's not specifically the dialogue that's changing, but all the things around the dialogue that's changing. I hope that made sense. I think it did. So back to the same uh, draft kind of topic, somebody did ask, um, do you have any tips specific to revision when the draft is complete? Dialogue is ready written and the characters sound too similar. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I did mention read it out loud. Uh, sometimes I don't notice that my characters sound too similar or that my characters have distinct voices, but for some reason in this one conversation, they start to sound like each other. This is something I was actually trying to correct very, very recently in a scene. And what I, and um, one thing I, I that my editor noticed was that this this conversation between the two characters had devolved into cliche. They were both speaking in cliche, and some of the sometimes it's useful, right? Because I think we do speak in cliches. Um, but she pushed my editor pushed me to like take away some of those cliches, and in doing that, I automatically made those two characters again sound like them like themselves, as opposed to. Um, sounding too much too similar but also sometimes um, there was another scene I was working on with two different characters and uh, they started to both sound like each other um, and I think that was just a case of me not thinking about the motivations that each individual character had in that scene uh, but it could also be a sign that you don't know those characters well enough um, that you can't separate them in in your head and so when you're writing dialogue they're sounding the same. And maybe it's that one character you know really well and the other character is sounding like that character, or it could be that both those characters are a little bit fuzzy. So I would ask yourself what, um, how well you know those characters. One thing that can uh, differentiate just on a more practical level uh, characters is um, word choice and diction and how formal uh, one speaks and how informal another one speaks. Can, can one be, think about like, is there an age difference between the characters and might one use slang? What kind of slang? Uh, slang from, I think sometimes we tend to uh, fall back on slang that was uh, slang that was trendy when we were of a certain age and we never really outgrow that. Like, I think I'm probably always using like 90s slang um, and it always sounds a bit funny if I try to use like modern day slang. So you might think about uh, slang and diction. Um, that passage that I read from Reproduction where Felicia, I just love it because Felicia, uh, she says things like, what does she say? What about your black mother who's um, something, some, I can't remember the exact expression, 
words, but she calls herself she self, which is really great. But then in the next line, she speaks very like the the word construction, um, sentence construction is very formal. And to me, that's like what that's revealing is that she's able to code switch in that way, uh, which I think is great. So you might think about that too, about code switching and if a character does it. Um, and that can be code switching too between the culture of how you are in the office and the culture of how you are at home. Or you might think about if the character's at home speaking with their partner, there's probably like inside jokes and a kind of a vocabulary of the partnership that is very unique to the partnership. And that vocabulary um, can maybe be woven into the dialogue to help that character sound distinct. I feel like I've just thrown a bunch of spaghetti at the wall. So whatever feels like it's going to stick. No, that's a great answer. Very in depth. And I think you covered a lot of a few of the questions that are that are being asked right now. Um, but this is a quite like broad question. So maybe you can help out for emerging writers. But um, do you have any tips on getting started with writing? Anything you should do before? Anything you should avoid? Um, sorry, anything you avoid doing before you start writing dialogue? Oh, that's a good question. No, I think apart from what I personally said, for, which is only maybe for me that I don't write, I don't force it. I have forced it and it's never a good, it's never good. I, I have forced it and I've just been very frustrated by it. Um, and it's always been a waste of time. Yeah, I wait, I wait for the characters to come. So one thing I didn't talk about, I don't think in the workshop, which is, is so important is to listen out in the real world. I think um, sometimes we think about writing as just being what we do at our desks, you know, with our pencils or, you know, click, click, click. But uh, a big part of, of the work of writing is, is reading and reading really carefully, um, reading for enjoyment, but also reading with this eye to parsing out the parts of craft, um, like what we've just done. Um, but also listening, being out in the world and listening to people around you. And I have a notes a note on my phone where I just, I write things that people say <laughs> because it's just wonderful. Um, and I don't necessarily use any of it, but just listening to how people speak. Um, I think that helps me write dialogue. Great question or great answer, sorry. So I think we only have time for one more question because we have three minutes left of the session. So I'm going to try and pick a good one. There are a few questions in regards to your slides. Um, I'm just gonna find one that I was looking at. And thank you everyone. And I apologize that there won't be enough time to answer all these questions. Where did it go? Uh, while you're looking, yeah, I'll just say again, listen um, to the dialogue around you and pay attention to what is, when you're listening to people talking or when you're in a conversation or you're part of a conversation, listen to uh, how everyone speaks and pay attention to like specific constructions. Um, I was in like a, a business -y meeting and someone said we got to juice this lemon dry and I thought oh I love that I wrote it down <laughs> I haven't been able to use it yet um, but also pay attention to the subtext of of real life because there's lots of subtext in real life and pay attention to when someone asks a question and it is not answered or it is answered the person answers but doesn't actually answer the question that is asked like pay attention to the kind of the 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 friction in the real world and uh the dynamics of character in the real world and i i swear to you that's going to really help you when you come to the page if you've like paid attention to that stuff so in regards to the powerpoint so it the workshop will be emailed to you so you can feel free to pause and write down some of the tips and stuff that sharon has shared but I will just ask this one last question because it has a few different, uh, a few upvotes. So Tima asked, any advice on how to handle people who speak different, who speak dialects or heavy accented English? Yeah, um, I don't think I mentioned this, but you know, my soapbox is, this is like the thing I preach in the desert is um, don't 
feel like you have to italicize the words that are not in English. I see this less now in books, uh, but it really it just makes me grind my teeth when I see these non-English words italicized. Um, I think, again, you know, it's your story. If you want to do that, you should absolutely have the power to do that, but don't feel like you have to be pressured into it because it's the way it's always been done. To me, italics is a tool just like anything else. And that tool is drawing attention and emphasizing a word. And if you think about uh, the character of Rocky um, in Rima Patel's Such Big Dreams, would she have thought the word Ferengi was anything special? No, she wouldn't. And so there's no reason for that to be italicized, which it is not. Um, so that's my first thing. In terms of uh, dialect, again, you can look at uh, books that you love that you think do it well. Um, I think I think Rima Patel's book is great because she weaves in Hindi words. Um, and actually, even Ian's book, um, Reproduction, does a good job of... Um, of, of dialect as well, uh, and, and like revealing code switching. Sorry, what was the question? Um, I feel like um, I'm gone. Any advice on writing, uh, let me pull it up. <laughs> so somebody was uh, heavy accented English or speaks dialects. Oh yes, okay, all right, all right. Uh, a little goes a long way too, like in terms of accents, I think a little goes a long way. Um, I was reading like something like, I want to say it's like an Agatha Christie. It's an older, much older book recently. And maybe it was like a French character or something. And every word was like written the way that it was pronounced. And it just became really tedious, I found. So pay attention as you're reading to what you think, the authors you think are doing it well and uh, look at how they do it. But my advice is a little goes a long way. Um, you don't have to explain or define every word that's not in English. People will understand the word Ferengi in that context. Um, you know, I don't speak Hindi at all. And there was a lot of like Hindi words and I was totally fine with it. I think it can add a lot of authenticity to a story. So don't be afraid of using it. Hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you, Sharon, and thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you for, for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. As a reminder that the workshop will be sent to you through email within the week. And as a friendly reminder, the fall 2024 is fast approaching, happening May or sorry, April 28th to May 5th, uh, virtually and in person. Our, in, our virtual events are held April 28th to May 1st with our virtual passes. May 2nd to 5th are held in Brampton, Ontario with our in-person passes. Registration opens in a few weeks on March 20th, so mark it on your calendar. More information can be found on our website at www.thefoldcanada.org. And thank you and have a great day. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us. And again, thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. <laughs>